may start by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha for the ruh or in honor of Sayyidah Narjis, mother of our 12th Imam. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين لا سيما ولي الله الأعظم حجة الله ابن الحسن صاحب العصر والزمان روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إني تارك فيكم الثكلين كتاب الله وعترتي أحل بيتي ما إن تمسكتم بهما لن تذل بعد أبدا صدق رسول الله وآمنا به صلى على محمد وآل محمد The Muslim Ummah is unanimous in that Rasulullah, before he passed away, on numerous occasions made provisions and commands to ensure that he would leave behind the Ummah with a source of guidance such that they would not go astray after his martyrdom. Because Islam, being a religion of eternity, must continue, its values must be propagated, its values must be protected from any form of distortion after the martyrdom of Rasulullah. Islam is a religion, its existence, its prosperity was not limited to the lifetime of Rasulullah, rather it was much greater than that. So you will see that even within the school of thought of the Ahlul Sunnah there is a hadith or there is this concept where Rasulullah through a tradition or through numerous traditions gave advice to the ummah or commanded the ummah to abide by two things as a source of guidance. This hadith in particular is known as Hadith al-Thakalain. The first version of Hadith al-Thakalain is like the one we recited at the end of the khutbah where Rasulullah says that I have left behind for you two major things. Inni tarikun fikum al two heavy things, two weighty things. The first one being the kitab, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, and the second one, my family, yani my Ahlul Bayt. So long as you hang on to these two, yani so long as that you follow the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt, you will not go astray. This is something which is widely recorded and narrated by scholars of the Ahl uh, Shia. You will see on the other side another version of Hadith al which is being narrated more popularly from the ulama of the Ahl Sunnah is that Rasulullah said, Inni kad taraktu fikum shay'ain aw thakalain. Ma in tamasaktum bihima, or the Hadith in particular, which is from the books, will say, Inni kad taraktu fikum shay'ain. Lan tadillu ba'dahuma. Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. So the hadith which is popularly quoted from the Ahl Sunnah is that the Prophet said, I leave behind you two things. So long as you abide by these two, you will not go astray. What are these two things? Kitab Allah, the Quran, and my Sunnah, the Sunnah of the Prophet. So both the Ahl Sunnah and the Ahl Shia believe that there was a hadith narrated by Rasulullah known as Hadith al Now, the discrepancy or the conflict or the disagreement happens on the last part of this hadith where we say that the hadith is 
kitab Allah wa itrati ahlul bayt whereas the others say no it is not the ahlul bayt it's a sunnah so to try and find out what is the right version of hadith of thakalain or which content what is the right words of rasulullah we try and analyze this hadith from two perspectives we will try to analyze the hadith from the perspective of matan which is content of the hadith and then we will try and analyze the validity of the hadith from a point of view of sanad which is chain of transmissions or transmitters and we we'll start with aloud salawat ala muhammad wa ala muhammad When we look into the analysis of this narration from Rasulullah as recorded or as narrated by majority of the scholars of the Ahlus Sunnah inni kad taraktu fikum thaqalain lan tadillu ba'dahuma kitabullah wa sunnati the idea over here is that so long as you hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah you will never go astray this is enough for you to be on siratul mustaqim if this is the case we ask or we start by asking the question what is the meaning of the word sunnah when you say sunnah or rasul or sunnah ali or sunnah umar or sunnah imam sadiq or sunnah imam al amr what does the word sunnah mean scholars of usul will tell you that the sunnah of the prophet encompasses or entails three things al qaul al fi'l wa at takrir which means the words of a masum the words of a rasul is part of the sunnah the actions of rasul are part of the sunnah and even the silence of rasulullah is part of a sunnah because the silence of the prophet when an action is being conducted in front of him denotes tacit approval of that action for example if we were to sit in front of rasulullah and i was eating dates if rasulullah did not say anything that means that eating dates is permissible it will become either from the wajib or the mustahab we will know that it is not makru or haram why because if i was to sit down and consume any item food item in front of rasulullah if it was haram then it would become wajib upon rasulullah to tell me the job of rasul is tabligh so the silence of rasulullah is also a hujja the similarly the words of rasulullah they are part of the sunnah and even the actions of rasulullah are sunnah so the definition of sunnah are that anything within these three fields that are related to rasulullah are counted as the sunnah tayyib now if they come and tell you that the prophet tells you i have left behind you two things the kitab and the sunnah number one the sunnah if we say as we said words actions and silence of the prophet who records the sunnah who narrates the sunnah it is the ashab companions correct now it is very possible that the prophet may say something and two companions understand two different thing altogether it could be very possible that the prophet said something and something else was understood either purposely intentionally or unintentionally many times even within the universities you have one professor you have one subject being taught he will explain a concept in a certain way but you have two students or five students each one of them have understood totally different things does this mean that the teacher is wrong law it's the way the words are perceived it's the way the words are understood each one takes a different understanding so the first objection that we raise towards the content of this hadith is that if the prophet has left behind the sunnah as a source of guidance it becomes an incomplete source of guidance or it is an imperfect source of guidance because so long as the sunnah is comprised of words and actions these words and actions are open to misinterpretation either on purpose or un unintentionally so either way to leave the actions on its own cannot be a perfect form of guidance number 1 number 2 when we say that the sunnah is a source of guidance and this sunnah needs to be taken from the companions of the prophet which companions of the prophet do we take it to rasulullah in this hadith has not told us take my sunnah from certain companions who do you listen to who do you believe when you're taking words and actions of the prophet do you accept the words of a companion who has been a companion for 6 months or somebody who's been a companion for 2 months or somebody who's been a companion for 5 years or 10 years who do you take the sunnah from 
This is why one of the biggest objections that we raise academically towards people such as Abu Huraira is that these people, somebody like Abu Huraira converted into Islam in the seventh year after Hijrah. He converted into Islam after the battle of Khaybar. And Rasulullah was martyred in 11 AH. So Abu, ha or Abu Huraira lived with Rasulullah for a period of three years. Only three years. Despite living with Rasulullah for three years, he is recorded to have narrated over 5,300 narrations from Rasulullah. Where did these 5,300 narrations come from? Yani, every year you are narrating, give or take, 1,500, 1,600 narrations from Rasulullah. This is a person who has converted into Islam in the last three years. Take somebody like Abu Bakr, who is considered to be one of the leading or earliest companions of Rasulullah. If you put all his narrations together, you don't even get to 150. According to some narrations, 146. Some narrations, 142. So a person who has been with Rasulullah from the days of Makkah until the last days, all these 23 years, has narrated only 140 hadith. Where did this Abu Huraira come with 5,300 5, hadith from? Where did this hadith come from? If this is the case, then by law of most educated person, most knowledgeable person, Abu Huraira should have been the first Imam. It should not have been Abu, Abu, Abu Bakr. He should have been the first Khalifa because he has memorized over 5,000 traditions. So when we have, when we look into this ahadith in terms of content where the Prophet says, my sunnah is a hujjah, and then he does not come and give you proper provisions over which companion to take the hadith from, there are ishkals over here. We say that this form of guidance is not a solid form of guidance. It's open to misconception, misrepresentation, and misuse. Furthermore, look at Abu Huraira as a person. Look at the quality of the hadith that are narrated from him. Some of them are totally, you know, utter garbage. They, they are a mockery to the intellect. Look at this hadith of which is narrated in Shahi Bukhari from Abu Huraira, Malakul Maut. He says, historically, once Rasulullah mentions Abu Huraira is narrating of Rasulullah, so-called. And we know that Rasul definitely has not narrated this. He says, one day Malakul Maut came to Nabi Musa. He came in front of Nabi Musa. He said to him, Ya Musa, it is time for you to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is time for your death. Nabi Musa got so angry and he gave him a box. Malakul Maut. He punched him in the eye. Look at the hadith. If not punch, slap. Because if I remember correctly, it said the latama, latama hu ala wajhe. He slapped him to the extent on his face. He slapped him on the eye to such an extent that he gorged out Malakul, Malakul Maut's eyes. Who oh, Malakul Maut went back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Ya Allah, you sent me down to take the ruh of uh, Nabi Musa. Look what Musa has done. He has slapped me and here is my eye. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the eye back for Malakul Maut and sent him down. If you read Masnad ibn Hanbal, it goes in addition to that, that Malakul Maut went to Allah, he complained to him, Ya Allah, Musa slapped me and now my eye has fallen out. So from that day, Allah made Malakul Maut invisible so nobody can attack him again, which is why people like me and you can't see Malakul Maut when he comes to us, lest we box him and take out his eye. Shunu. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. For even the quality of the hadith or which companions to take hadith from is not mentioned by Rasulullah. So by content, when Rasul says, according to this version of the hadith, if you hang on to my sunnah, you will not go astray. This sentence in itself is not valid because the proper provisions have not been made. Number two. Number three, the third objection on this hadith and this version of the hadith is that the sunnah of Rasulullah is protected by who? By the companions. Let us assume that the companions who memorized these sunnah of Rasulullah, these traditions of Rasulullah, memorized it correctly and did not misinterpret it. Suppose they died without having narrated the traditions of Rasulullah. For example, you have a companion X. He has memorized 100 hadith of Rasulullah. But he died before conveying these hundred hadith to the next listener. Suppose he conveyed 80 hadith and then he died. And this person who memorized 80 
narrated 60 and then died. And the third generation narrated 40 and then died. What would happen? Over a period of 200, 300 years, the narrations or the sunnah of Rasulullah will have disappeared. Because the rate at which people are dying is faster than the rate at which they can narrate these ahadith. And then there come in other natural issues where a person may forget the hadith due to old age. Why isn't there any provision given for somebody to memorize or protect the hadith? So from here we say that the sunnah again in itself, if a person accepts this version, he is not guaranteed full source 100% guidance that will protect him from the wrong path. This is number three. Number four, or the next ishqal. We say that even, suppose, we can get rid of all these problems if we record the hadith and we record the sunnah of Rasulullah. Let us suppose that the sunnah of Rasulullah could be protected or recorded in the form of books or in the form of writing, such that everybody who refers back to the books of the sunnah will not go astray. Hence, the kitabullah, the Quran, and the sunnah should be enough. If this is the case, or if this was the argument that was put forward to us, again, we are able to raise objections if the sunnah of Rasulullah was to be protected and then serve as a reason or as a measure of guidance to the people. Why did the first two khila khalifs, Abu Bakr and Umar, insist on the prohibition of the recording of the hadith and in many cases burning of the hadith after the martyrdom of Rasulullah? The first proof for this, Imam al-Dhahabi, again, ulama from the Ahl sunnah in his book, Tadhkiratul Huffa, he mentions on authority a narration from Aisha that, Aisha that she came to her father, Abu Bakr. And she says to him, Abu Bakr came to him, or Abu Bakr, excuse me, came to her and said, Oh Aisha, bring for me those 500 texts or 500 scrolls of paper in which the hadith of Rasulullah were recorded. So Aisha says, I went, I brought this collection of ahadith of Rasulullah, I brought them to my father. My father took these collections and he lit them on fire and he burnt the sunnah of Rasulullah. So Aisha said, she says in the hadith, she said, I asked my father, oh father, why did you burn these traditions? So in reply, Abu Bakr said to her, oh my daughter, I'm scared that maybe somebody recorded a hadith or a sunnah of Rasulullah which was untrue and then would put the ummah into chaos and into conflict. So I burnt all the hadith. Baba, we, maybe we could have checked. We would have uh, discussed which hadith is correct, which hadith is untrue. There's a whole panel of sahabis who were there. You could have sat with them. Each one of them would have discussed which hadith is correct, which hadith is not correct. Furthermore, Rasulullah said from the hadith or from the sunnah, take from me what matches the Quran, what agrees with the Quran, what contradicts the Quran, throw it away. There was no point of burning the entire sunnah. So this is the first ishqal again. And secondly, if we accept hadith al-thakalim as per what the ulama of the Ahl sunnah said, that Rasulullah said, inni tarikun fikum al-thakalim, kitabullah wa sunnati, then the first person to oppose the sunnah of Rasulullah is Abu Bakr, because he went and burnt the sunnah of Rasulullah. Here yeah, Rasul is saying, I'm leaving you the Quran and the Sunnah. And Abu Bakr burnt down the Sunnah. So either Rasul is right or Abu Bakr is right. Choose one of the two. This is one ishqal that comes over there. The second one is that it is again narrated by Imam an Nawawi, one of the ulama of the Ahl Sunnah. He has written a book, Sharah Sahih Bukhari. So he has got his translation or his commentary on Sahih Bukhari. Imam Nawawi in this book records a hadith by a companion of the Prophet called Abu Sa'id al-Khadari. Abu Sa'id says, I heard from Rasulullah a hadith which said, Erase everything that has been recorded about me except the Quran. Apparently, Rasulullah has narrated this tradition. Erase everything about me, anything to do with my sunnah except the Quran. If we accept this hadith to be true and we hadith and we accept this version of hadith al-thakalain to be true, what happens? Contradiction. Over here Rasulullah is saying, Inni kataraktu fikum thakalain kitabullahi wa sunnati. And over here Rasulullah is saying, La taktubu anni shay'am min sunnati. Don't write anything about me and my sunnah. So there is a contradiction. Which hadith is correct, this one or that one? If we say both the hadith are correct, that means Rasulullah was contradictory in his words. 
which means he cannot be the prophet of his time if he's contradicting statements. This means he cannot be truthful or trustworthy, which means he cannot be Amin or Sadiq. Furthermore, the implications about these are much deeper. If you say Rasulullah contradicts himself, this means Allah contradicts himself. Why? Because in the Quran, we have the verse that says, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَىٰ he does not speak out of his own will except that he speaks revelation of Allah. Which means if the Prophet contradicts himself, this means Rasulullah. If, if Rasulullah contradicts himself, this means Allah contradicts himself. If Allah contradicts himself, then he contradicts himself for one of two reasons. Either Allah contradicts himself on purpose, which will make him غير hakim, which means he is not adil anymore. وَالْعَيَاضُ billah kufr. That means remove adala from your Usuluddin. Or if Allah contradicts himself because he didn't know out of ignorance, this means he's not Al Alim, which means he's not Allah. Again, kufr we have done. You commit kufr tacitly by accepting these two hadith. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And this in itself shows the invalidity of both the hadith. Another angle or another objection towards this version of Hadith al-Thakalain. When Rasulullah was in his deathbed, again, as mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Ah, and before we move on to this uh, objection, another objection comes in. According to this Hadith, which is in the commentary of Sahih Bukhari, Rasulullah ordered that everything about his Sunnah should be wiped out. Then you, Mr. Bukhari, why did you write a book, Sahih Bukhari? Why did you write Sahih Muslim, a whole book capturing the Sunnah of Rasulullah? Then you yourself have violated the order of Rasulullah because Rasulullah said, don't write anything from my Sunnah. And then you come and you write an eight-volume book in the, <laughs> in the uh, Sunnah of Rasulullah. So he himself, if he follows this hadith, has committed a sin. This is one. We move on to the next ishqal. The next objection from, again, it is mentioned that on Rasulullah during his deathbed made an announcement where he said, will you bring me a pen and a paper such that I may write for you something if you follow this piece or this command, none of you will go astray. What happened? Umar ibn Khattab stood up and he said, Hasbuna kitabullah wa musibata. Over here Rasulullah is saying, inni kad taraktu fikum thakalain. Kitabullahi wa sunnati. Over here Umar is saying, Hasbuna kitabullah. The kitab or the book of Allah is sufficient. Does this mean that Umar went against this hadith if this hadith is correct? So either Umar has gone against the sunnah of Rasulullah or Rasulullah had not explained himself clearly. One of the two. Again, the ishqal or the objection comes to the ulama of the Ahl Sunnah to solve for us. From here or from these few number of objections, we are able to derive the incorrectness and the invalidity of this hadith portrayed by the scholars of the Ahl Sunnah where Rasulullah said, Inni kad taraktu fikum thakalain kitabullahi wa sunnati. From the content of the hadith, we are able to derive a number of objections which prove its invalidity. This is all from the side of Matan. And then there is an objection that we can derive from the side of the Sanad, yani from the chain of transmitters. The number of people who transmit this hadith, what is their validity, what is their credibility? We start with one loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In this chain of transmitters, there is a person called Saleh ibn Musa al-Talahi. He is one of the peace. He is one of the people. There is one person in this chain of transmission whose name is Saleh ibn Musa al-Talahi. He is one of the reporters within this chain of, or within this chain of narrators. Let us look at what ulama of the Ahl Sunnah, as per their rules and their regulations of Ilm al-Rijal, have to speak about Saleh ibn Musa al-Talahi. You refer back to the book, Tariq al-Sagheer by 
by al muslim or by al bukhari you will see himself in according to tahdib al ahkam one of the major books of the ahl sunnah they mention in accordance with al dhahabi they mention that this person salih ibn musa at talahi is a person who is unreliable in his narrations in tahdib al ahkam they say that this person's words are not worth anything at all a person whose words are not worth anything from the perspective of rijal this hadith is weak and ghair mu'tabar is unreliable so then all these ulama and all these imam al jamaa who keep saying inni tarikun fikum thaqalain kitab allah wa itrati from where do they follow these things their own scholars of rijal are saying that this hadith is not credible and unreliable so from the perspective of sanad chain of transmission and from perspective of the matan content of the hadith we say that this hadith is absolutely invalid and batil sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad which brings us to the other version of the hadith where rasulullah said inni tarikun fikum thaqalain kitab allah wa itrati ahla bayti ما ان تمسكتم بهما لن تذل بعد ابدا رسول الله says that i have left behind you or i am leaving behind for you two weighty things the quran and the ahlul bayt look at even from the perspective of the content there is logic behind this and for the time frame that we have we will just touch upon it the fact that you have ahlul bayt side by side with the quran the ahlul bayt are those people selected by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designated by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala people who are infallible people who do not succumb to their vain desires people who do not need guidance themselves rather are a light or a source of guidance for other people allah has selected them to be the interpreters of the quran so long as you listen to their version of the quran so long as you submit to their version of the seerah and the sunnah there has to be an infallible person from the side of allah designated by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can explain the book of allah there has to be a person who understands the sunnah of the prophet of allah who is designated from allah subhanahu which is why we refer to the ahlul bayt as being the quran natik and the quran that is revealed in the book as the quran summit these people rasulullah had made a provision where there were certain people selected by allah whom the prophet had mentioned who would be guardians and custodians of the quran and its interpreters guardians and custodians of the sunnah such that it would not be misinterpreted or would not be misused for any other private agenda throughout time number one this is muwafiq the way they say goes along or matches even the theme in the quran many times when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about authority in the quran and is talking about guidance through this authority he will always mention three parties of authority that are there look at the verse of the quran which talks about or that praises amir al mu'minin when he gave uh, his ring in the form of ruku while in salah what does allah say bismillah rahman rahim inna ma waliyukum allah wa rasuluh wal ladina amanu al ladina yuqimuna as salat wa yu'tuna az zakat wa hum raki'un your wali your master is three who allah the prophet who after allah and the prophet who can explain to you the concepts of tawhid and explain to you the principles of nabuwa the imam look at other verses in the quran where allah says uti allah wa rasula wa uti allah wa uti ar rasul wal ul al amri minkum allah says order or obey me your prophet and then who the ul al amr there are always three parties of obedience there have always been three authorities or chains of authority at which level not at a horizontal level wal ayadu billah then become shirk at a vertical level where your first chain of authority is allah 
Your second chain of authority is Rasulullah and after him the Ahlul Bayt. In this verse they are known as the Ulil Amr. In that verse they are known as those people who give zakat in ruku. Which is why we say in our kalima as well we have three levels or three chains of authority. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah Ali Waliullah. So the hadith in itself, in its tacit way, in its direct way and indirect way matches the content of the Quran and it is pure logical. Secondly, when you look at it from the perspective of a sanad chain of transmitters, hadith al-thakalain as per our recordings, Kitabullahi wa itrati ahla bayti has reached the level of tawatur just like the hadith of Gadir from amongst scholars of the Ahle Shia as well as the scholars of the Ahle Sunnah. In fact, majority of the books of the Ahle Sunnah record hadith al-thakalain as being Kitabullahi wa itrati and not sunnati. Refer back to Sahih Tirmidhi. You will find Kitabullahi wa Itrati. Go back to Sunan al Bayhaqi. You will find Kitabullahi wa Itrati. Go back to Sahih Bukha, Go back to Sahih Muslim. You will find Kitabullahi wa Itrati. Go to Yanabi ul Mawadda Alama Kundizi. You will find Kitabullahi wa Itrati. Jalaluddin Suyuti, one of the greatest mufassirin of the Ahle Sunnah, you will find Kitabullahi wa Itrati. Masnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal, you will find Kitabullahi wa Itrati. Tayyib, where did Kitabullahi wa Sunnati come from? From the books of the Ahle Sunnah, this hadith has reached Tawatur, that I leave behind you two things, two weighty things, the book of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt. So we come back to them and we ask them, where did the Sunnah? Why is the Ahlul Bayt shunned by these people? Why is enmity shown towards the Ahlul Bayt? Why are these hadith and sources, primary sources like Sunan al Bayhaqi, why are hadith like these removed from their text or shunned from their text? Why don't their Imam al Jama'as mention this in their Jum'ah over there? That no, Rasulullah stood up and he said, Ahlul Bayt. Why this jealousy? Why this animosity? Why this constant attempt to hide the fada'il of Amir al muminin and the fada'il of Ahlul Bayt? This is a question that we need to ask. And we pose these questions in a non-violent way, in a non-confrontational way. We don't call anyone shirk. We don't call anyone kafir. We don't say anyone who doesn't believe in Ahlul Bayt, their blood is halal abadan. We are here to talk art and academic level and to unveil the truth and let the truth be the path of every free human being to follow. This is our job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given an akal, has made us free human beings so that we may discover the truth and then follow it from there. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. An objection may be put towards the wordings of Hadith of Thakalain as narrated from the scholars of the Ahl Shia. Sometimes when you read Hadith of Thakalain, you will see the Hadith stance where Rasulullah says, Inni tarikun fikum of Thakalain. And many times you will find the Hadith, it says, Inni kad taraktu fikum Thakalain. Or sometimes you will see the Hadith says, Inni mukhlifun fikum of Thakalain. So now people will come and so people have come and have objected. People have come and objected. You are Shia. You are saying that Rasulullah said that he has left behind you two sources of guidance, the book and the Ahlul Bayt. If one prophet made one hadith and over 70 companions heard this hadith, how come there is a discrepancy? How come there are differences in the words used by Rasulullah? Doesn't this mean that the companions didn't understand the words of Rasulullah or they are changing the words of Rasulullah? One prophet one kalam, 70 companions in one place. Somebody had inni tarikun fikum thakalain. Somebody had inni taraktu fikum thakalain. Somebody had inni mukhlifun. It's not even close. Mukhlif and tarik, two different things. So they come and say because there are variances in the words within the content of the hadith, this hadith has to be weak. So a person who makes such an objection, we tell to him, Habibi, your objection is weaker than the house of a spider. 
Why? Because even though there are discrepancies in the contents of the word of Rasulullah, this goes on to show that Rasulullah made the same announcement using different words in different locations multiple times. Somebody heard it in Ghadir. From the Ahlul Sunnah you have on the day of Ghadir after Rasulullah said, Man kuntu mawla fahadam aliyum mawla. He went on to say, Inni tarikun fikum muthakalain. Kitabu Allahi wa itrati ahlul bayt. On the day of Arafah, even before Ghadir, he said, Inni mukhlifun fikum muthakalain. Kitabu Allahi wa itrati. In Ghadir, Rasulullah said, My ahlul bayt and my Quran. On the day of Arafah, Rasulullah said, My Quran and my ahlul bayt. On his deathbed, he said, My Quran and my ahlul bayt. On Ghadir, he said, Kad taraktu. On uh, Arafah, he said, Inni tarikun. And on his deathbed, he said, Inni mukhlifun. Rather, the hujja comes back to you wherever Rasulullah had an opportunity. He said, My Quran and my ahlul bayt. Our end conclusion is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected a number of individuals who are free from any type of impurity, individuals who are infallible, selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ensure that the Quran will never be distorted, to ensure that the Quran will always be understood in the way it should be, and they themselves will continue in the seerah and the sunnah of Rasulullah. Hence this hadith. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the shake of these nights of Shahrul Ramadan if we have not been forgiven until today. Ya Allah, on a night like this, you forgive us our sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of Ahlul Bayt. Any or one of our friends and family members who are not in the best of health, you grant them shafa'a. All our family members and friends who have passed away, Ya Allah, you make them their covers into a field of Jannah. We pray to you, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give us the tawfiq to serve Ahlul Bayt. We ask you for this ni'mah of love of Ahlul Bayt in our hearts. We ask you, Ya Allah, to hasten the reappearance of our twelfth Imam and to make us from amongst his companions and disciples. Wa akhirud da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.